Hello everyone and uh, a warm welcome for, uh, to all of us uh, for today's session with Mel Gave. Uh, we are going to talk today about uh, her first book and research, Trampled by Unicorn, um, how to thrive in tech um, and, and also how to fix the problem that we have. Um, so this session will last one hour. Uh, We've planned it as a Q&A session, so we expect uh, you to ask all your questions. So for that, you can use the Q&A section at uh, the bottom of your screen. You can also use the chat if you prefer, but it's easier for us uh, to manage the questions through the Q&A uh, section. You can ask your question at any moment, and we'll try to make sure that we answer all of them before the end of the session. Um, so before introducing Mael, I'm going to talk a little bit about 50 in tech and why we are doing what we're doing now and what we're building. So 50 in tech is a community and a platform gathering today over 5,000 members all over the world. Our mission is to make the future of tech inclusive by engaging and empowering women in tech, um, by giving them visibility and enabling them to connect with the right people to help them achieve their goals, should it be finding a new job, fundraising, a career change or development, and at the most, uh, when they need it. We have built an online networking platform with the objective of achieve, achieving parity in tech uh, globally. Our community is inclusive and we welcome committed actors such as companies, investors and mentors such contributing to a diverse and equal digital economy. So this uh, brings me to today's conversation. Um, as I was telling, it's, it's going to last one hour. Uh, we're going to try to split it in two equal times, so 30 minutes uh, for a discussion with Mael, moderated by Caroline Hamad, CEO of 15Tech and myself. I'm the co-founder of 15Tech with Caroline. And then uh, we'll leave uh, the last 30 minutes for a question and answer from the, from, from the audience. So, Mel, we are really thrilled to welcome you today. Um, so, you are uh, what we can call a, a role model. You've been um, a leader on the, for oh, yes, <laughs> on the forefront of tech. Um, you've been named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum one of 14, 40 under 40, one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company, and you were number fifth among uh, Time Magazine list of top 25 female entrepreneurs. Congratulations for, for that. Um, about your career path, um, you've been working uh, six years as a principal as a Boston consulting group. And, um, and after that, you became CEO of uh, an e-commerce website, a Russian one called ozon.ru. Um, you've been the executive VP of operation uh, at Priceline Group, which is a travel agency. And uh, recently uh, you were the CEO of uh, Compass Real Estate Platform, a company that was valued at over $6 billion, which is amazing. Uh, trampled by Unicorns is your first book. It's um, talking about um, where big, big techs um, have been failing recently. And you're also bringing a lot of solution to, to bring more empathy uh, to correct um, this, um, this problem. The first thing I want to ask is what, um, what made you start this book? Um, and um, well, yeah, what was the reason why you, you, you started this book? Is that something that you've experienced yourself or, well, how did that happen? Yeah, so good morning from New York. Uh, very, very happy to talk to you. Um, so I, I've been talking about this topic about how to put humanity at the center of tech for quite some time. I've worked in tech for 15 years and for a large portion of it, I talked about how building a great tech company didn't start with a great product. Uh, it starts with great people who care about other people and then these great people go and build great products. Um, so again, pretty much 15 years of that kind of conversation. And then six years ago, I found myself sitting next to the senior editor of Wired 
uh, during a lunch, completely by chance, and I started explaining to him why I was worried about the, the power that big tech was starting to accumulate, uh, why we needed both a gigantic wake-up call of tech leaders and users, by the way, we can talk about that later, but also a deeper thinking beyond self-regulation. It was very obvious to me already that it wouldn't be enough and that we were, uh, we were getting closer and closer to having major human issues. Um, at the time, that gentleman challenged me to write about this, and it became the first article I ever published. So six years ago, I published my first op-ed in Wired, uh, calling for more regulation of tech companies at a time where it was really, uh, it was really not the topic of conversation. Everybody was talking about how amazing big tech was and how much better the world was uh, going to be. And so when I published the article, um, my tech peers. Uh, we're not particularly happy and I got a lot of I got a lot of feedback about why are you, what are you talking about? We don't we don't need the government in there uh, Everything is fine. Tech companies are making the world a better place. Like what, what are you talking about? Uh, and this is precisely because I got a lot of uh, bad feedback from my tech peers at the time uh, that I got even more convinced that we had a problem and that the problem was only going to grow. And so that led to a second article, a third, a fourth, then a few speeches. And then before I knew it, I had a book deal and I found myself sitting pretty much where I'm sitting today and saying, okay, I guess I have to write a book. So, um, so that's why I ended up writing this book. I really wanted to write uh, what I would call a solution-driven policy book for big tech leaders themselves, because I'm a capitalist at heart. I really believe that the changes need to start with the companies themselves. Uh, I wanted to write a book that uh, the consumers, the users, you and me, uh, could actually use as they think about their relationship to big tech and how they use the product. And then, and then very clearly, I wanted also to write a book uh, about how governments can help supplement all these efforts and fill the void that uh, self-regulation creates no matter what. Okay, so it started with self-regulation for, for these big tech companies because they've acquired too much power at some point, the companies or maybe the CEOs or both. Yeah, it started, the, the, a lot of these companies, and by the way, it's not, it's not just tech. I mean, th this conversation about uh, the role of government in companies has been going on for as long as I'm sure history has been there, uh, but certainly for most of the 20th century, without any doubt. Um, and, and so industry like the banking industry, the airline industry, the, the chemical industry, all of these companies, the telecom industry, all of these industries at one point or another had pretty intense conversation with uh, the US government or the, the European governments, because for some of them that was before the European Union, about like, should or should not um, the governments it, make some rules about how this company should be run. And again, I cannot emphasize enough, I'm, I'm, I am not advocating for a complete uh, top-down government management. Uh, I lived in countries, I lived in Russia, I lived in China. I have experienced firsthand what it is to be in countries where governments are extremely powerful. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is where we should be, we should be uh, going. I'm just saying that between do whatever you want, self-regulate yourself, no oversight, we, we count on you to be the best you can be. And the Chinese model, maybe there is a third way where we can find something that would uh, continue to foster innovation, continue to reward the hard work of entrepreneurs, and at the same time, uh, be aligned with the vision of society that, by the way, we as citizens uh, voted for. Like we elected our government, uh, at least in democratic society, we have democratically elected government that are supposed to implement a vision of society that we as voters um, have decided that we wanted to live in. So to me, it's just about finding the right, the right balance. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I wanted to, to, I was wondering at first, uh, before we started talking, uh, whether the Me Too movement uh, was also one of the reasons why you started uh, thinking about this project, but I understand that it was even beyond that. Um, 
what um, this Me Too movement has been bringing into this uh, debate. So, yeah, so I, you said it absolutely right. I started talking about that topic way before the Me Too movement. Uh, and the book was well on its way already in one way or another uh, when we started having uh, the, the second wave of the Me Too movement uh, in tech. And then, and then the Black Lives Matter movement yeah, here in the US. So um, it doesn't mean that I don't believe that fixing diversity is not a challenge. I think it's a massive challenge and something that big tech absolutely need to do a better job at. Uh, but to me, it's almost at, at the risk of maybe being controversial for some, for some people, I, I believe that diversity is just almost like the top of the iceberg. It's, it's, it's the symptom of a, of a, I don't know if it's a bigger problem, but it's a symptom of a certain culture. It's not like we have a diversity problem and so because of that everything happens. It's more like we have a culture uh, that is based on a certain number of myths um, around technology neutrality, around meritocracy, around uh, disruption being a force of good, and all of that also translate into a diversity uh, very significant issue. I don't want to downplay it. It's just what is the symptom and what is the cause? Yeah, um, we, we already have one question. So I will uh, ask it right now because it's uh, linked to something that we were discussing earlier. So um, the Ka Caroline Petty is asking, is the issues that we've gone too far with companies like Facebook, that the entire code bank has been created around driving revenue metrics, and that even with regulation, they couldn't change even if they wanted to now? This is a very smart question. I think that one of the biggest questions we're having right now, and that's going to be me rephrasing her question, is really can the business model evolve enough that it supports the, again, the vision of society that in the Western world uh, we want to have. And it's really a question because it's unclear. It's unclear for many reasons. It's unclear because um, it's not obvious whether or not the management actually want, want that to happen, uh, especially in the case of Facebook. It's, it's not clear that they actually want to solve these problems, uh, mainly because they, they have this deep belief, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm naive, uh, but I, I think that it's more a belief than a quest for money. They have this deep belief that free speech trumps everything else and this absolute way of thinking about free speech which by the way we don't have in europe in europe we believe in free speech but we also uh we also for example uh ban nazi propaganda so we do have limits to free speech despite being uh free speech nations we don't have this absolute that the us has and, and that facebook is using so um, again, good question. Unclear because it's not obvious whether or not Facebook management, if we're talking specifically about Facebook, is going to be okay to uh, come down from their, from their free speech soapbox and actually really address the problem. The second, as you mentioned it in your question, is that this one is a financial one that would require a pretty fundamental change of the business. My view, though, is that it's totally possible. It, it will probably, I mean, it would very, very likely uh, means uh, lower growth and lower profitability. But we are talking about uh, a company which is rapidly approaching a trillion dollar market cap. Uh, if they are growing a little less fast and are slightly less profitable, I'm not sure that's, that's necessarily an issue um, as such. I mean, some investors may disagree with me, but uh, yeah. and so when we're talking about the business model, just to go one level deeper, I think the, the, the big question marks here are one, what do you do with uh, micro targeting? Like this is the, the core of the core of the questions because a lot of the issue we're having right now come from the fact that uh, in particular in politics, um, you can identify 
at an extremely, extremely precise level people. And as a result of that, you can very easily target them with content uh, that will manipulate their emotions and manipulate their opinions. And you would do that in a completely, um, completely transparent way, meaning nobody will know exactly what you were doing and who you showed it to. So that's the first big issue. The second big issue uh, around the business model is uh, what I would frame as freedom of reach versus freedom of speech. Um, and so right now, it's not, the, the, the fundamental problem is not the absolute uh, belief in freedom of speech. The, the core problem is that um, you can promote um, false information, misinformation, misleading information, manipulative information with very little effort uh, and amplify it and amplify it and amplify it because freedom of speech is also associated in Facebook with freedom of reach. And so you can have the most outrageous comments uh, or articles and, and be able to promote that to billions of people. Uh, and that is like a pretty significant uh, issue. So to me, it's, it's like figuring out how do we limit micro targeting and then figuring out how do we uh, create some oversight, basically, either internal or through governments, uh, oversight of recommendation algorithm, um, which are clearly right now uh, optimized for outrageous content rather than true content. And then if you want to add the cherry on the cake, yes, there is this question of censorship, uh, which in the US at least will always be extremely, um, extremely debated. Uh, in Europe, we have, for historical reasons, we have adopted uh, what I believe, and I'm European, so I'm biased, but what I believe to be a slightly more pragmatic approach Mm -hmm. uh, but in the U.S., this question of is it okay for Facebook to take down content, not limit the reach, but take down content, is is going to be a really, really massive issue. And I don't, I don't expect any resolution anytime soon. But that would be the third, the third, uh, the third potential uh, focus to change the business model. Does it mean maybe because you were saying that in Europe we are like, yeah, we have this sense of censorship, etc. Does it mean that maybe the solution will come from companies in Europe, you think, uh, you know, to make the change happen? And if, if so, <clears throat> which company could be the leader of this change? Uh, look, the blunt truth right now is that when it comes to social media, Europe is nowhere. And yeah. so we can, you, I, look, I'm very pro-European, I'm very pro-French, I feel very French, I love my country. Uh, I really, really wish I could tell you that, like, there is a social network in the making in France or in Europe that is going to be an alternative to uh, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. The reality is that there isn't. Um, we may be having conversations around the role of the European Commission, like GDPR, for example, was at, was at the forefront of uh, conversation around data ownership and privacy. It's not a perfect policy, but it's, it's a policy that actually has moved a lot of things and that was used as the base for California, uh, for example, as they were thinking about their, their data policies. Uh, we may also uh, be able to provide um, technical solutions to the question of censorship. And again, I don't like the word censorship because it's usually used as a very negative way. I don't think that uh, not allowing Nazi propaganda in social media is, is bad censorship. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe in the US that would be a hugely debated thing, but... Um, and so I think we can potentially in Europe, because we have such a strong, uh, such a strong engineering uh, workforce and really solid education in engineering, um, I think we could potentially over time provide some technological solution that if the leaderships of these different social media were interested in, could, they could potentially implement it. But like, let's be realistic, there is no, uh, there's no social media coming from Europe anytime soon that is going to be replacing these big companies. Yeah, and unless, unless social media <laughs> drop for a time, I don't know if that can happen. 
But this makes me uh, jump to another question, which is um, uh, AI, algorithm, machine learning, and, uh, and all those questions that are um, like a big trend at the moment. We don't really know where it's uh, going, but what we can see is that um, there are some issues to fix already um, because these machines, these algorithms are built by, um, let's say, only one kind of person, one kind of profile, and we know that there's a lot of biases. So how do you see that evolve, maybe, in the future? And how can we maybe fight against these issues uh, on our side? What needs to be done? Yeah, so, um, so it's... AI is definitely, I believe that AI is going to be really the next wave of innovation uh, in, in terms of what is going to change about the technology ecosystem. I think we've seen a few, and we, we're, as, as tech people, we are really waiting for it because the last, I would consider the last big two to be mobile and cloud. And, and now, especially in the consumer uh, internet, like there's not, there's not a lot of new stuff. Um, and so as a technologist, I'm actually uh, pretty excited about what AI is going to be able to do in the future. Um, having said that, um, I think there is also like any, uh, like any innovation, there is a positive side and there is a negative side. The phone, when, when, the, when mobile phone got released, uh, that helped create a completely, as I mentioned, a completely new wave of new companies. Uh, there were a lot of companies uh, that would just not exist without mobile, uh, Uber, Uber being one of them, but there are plenty of others that if you don't have a mobile phone, they just don't exist. So I, I believe that AI is going to be the same, uh, but the, the mobile phone is also a tracking device. So it's fantastic. You can get a car with a push of a button. Uh, it's also really bad because they can track you everywhere. I believe that AI is the same. It's going to be amazing because there's a lot of things and we, we're just starting to figure out what this is going to be. But there are a lot of things that uh, we can't do right now uh, that will be made possible by AI. I think a lot of the uh, repetitive tasks, a lot of the uh, non-customized experiences uh, will change fundamentally with uh, as AI is being used more and more. At the same time, yeah, AI is going to create massive, uh, massive issues around civil liberties. And um, I think the, the, the cat is out of the bag. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people saying, oh, we need to stop AI. We need to put it back in the bag. Uh, we need to stop facial recognition. I'm like, it's too late. I, I think we can, uh, we can have a conversation about how to slow it down but i've never seen any any true innovation just being stopped as such so to me the real conversation we need to have around ai is more about how do we preserve civil liberties and i'm going to explain that a little more and how do we ensure that there's as limited bias as possible and back to your me too question and diversity like, like that's a really really important topic for women for minorities etc so in terms of civil liberties uh, what I'm talking about is you should, um, as, a, as a citizen, as a private citizen, as a user, you should always um, be given the opportunity to opt out, to know what data is being collected, to know how your data is being used. You should be able to um, appeal when there is um, wrong or uh, inappropriate recommendation based on your data. Uh, you should be able to hold accountable uh, all these companies. Right now, it doesn't exist. Like right now, if you are falsely uh, accused, and I use the word accused in a very broad sense of, of, of that word, um, you don't, there's no, there's no way for you to say, oh, the algorithm got it wrong. Can you please just change it? It's just, it doesn't work that way, you can't, you, you, you don't know where to go. So I think there's a, a massive, massive question around how do we create uh, a system where private citizens, uh, where users can actually have an influence uh, on AI and can actually decide when AI is being used, are actually aware of when AI is being used. So that's one big thing. 
And then the second, the second piece is what we started talking about earlier in this conversation around algorithm, algorithmic transparency and oversight. Um, and it's basically this idea that um, AI operates under, uh, operates on basis of massive data sets. And as I'm sure uh, a lot of uh, a lot of you are fully aware because you're all from the tech world, uh, data set have bias. They are full of false positive and false negative when you use them uh, with whatever algorithm you built. And so the question becomes, how, uh, how do you make sure that your algorithm, uh, so your data, have, your data set has as little bias as possible? And how do you make sure that your, uh, your algorithm um, in the same way has as little bias as possible? And that requires a certain form of transparency and oversight. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be done by government. Uh, I, am, I am extremely, uh, extremely worried about government being too closely involved with this, uh, with this super power uh, because history again has shown that usually the more power you give to government, uh, the, the worse they use it. So we have to be pretty mindful about how we want, uh, we want this oversight to work. But there is no doubt in my mind that we cannot afford as a society to have companies more powerful than our democratically elected governments uh, who, and that can decide what they show us, how they show us, how they collect our data, what they do with our data, without any kind of oversight and any kind of transparency. So maybe it's a third party uh, oversight. There's different ways of, of thinking about that problem, but like just saying, oh, you do whatever you want and then uh, you let us know how it goes as your experiment on humanity just doesn't do it for me. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I hope this answers uh, the, the question of Luis, uh, who's been writing a question. So as a discloser, he, he was saying that he's a software engineer who worked at Facebook and also Amazon. And basically, he was saying that um, at the level of an engineer, um, there, is, uh, there is no one who's really able to, 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 to decide how to target and you know what the algorithm is actually going to to produce as a result um, because there are so many of them that are plugged together um, answering to to anyone and his question was uh, is it fair to attribute some intent to these big companies um, so i understand from what you said that, that yes because they have to take accountability for the data they are tracking and how they use it and I think also this accountability has to, to go down the hierarchy in the, in the companies, so from the people who are the decision maker to the one uh, as Louis, software engineer, who's actually working with this data, but it's like a, almost a dangerous product. We never know what's going to happen in the end. Um, all right, so I have very mixed feeling about this question. Uh, about this question. Um, all right, so let me try to answer it the best way I can. <laughs> um, it is absolutely true that um, we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of people working on the code that is responsible for creating this algorithm. Absolutely point, point taken. Uh, and that creates some fairly significant challenge uh, around how to make sure that what is being um, what is being created actually serves a certain purpose and and doesn't and, and is really well understood. So that's for that. Having said that, um, I find um, troubling that companies that make billions of dollars are telling us that the product that helps them make billions of dollars is really not under their control. Mm. And that, yeah, they created a bit of a Frankenstein monster. Sorry, actually they never used the word sorry, by the way, which is a different, different topic of conversation. It's like, oh, sorry, yeah, we created that. We, we, don't, we, we don't really know how to, handle it. 
uh, I think that's BS. I think that at some point you need to grow up and if you create something, you're responsible for the things you created. When, when we look at uh, what the, um, the chemical industry created, sometimes they create stuff they didn't really think through the impact that it would have on the atmosphere or on the planet in general. It doesn't change the fact that they're fully accountable with what they put outside and what they created. Um, so I'm, I'm having a really, really hard time to um, be friendly to the argument of, ah, sorry, we built that stuff we don't really know how to control because we have hundreds of engineers uh, managing it. So that's the first point. The second point is, um, it is equally surprising to see how um, a lot of the side effects of this product have not been tested. They have not been thought through. They have not, like they, they seem to continuously surprise these companies. Like, oh, we didn't realize that somehow our algorithm clearly identifies white males, but doesn't identify well at all uh, women with dark uh, skin. And somehow we didn't think about testing that. Like, we missed, we, we missed that point. At what point do we tell them, look, people, like, you got to do a better job before you release your product to actually test them. Like, we, none of us on this call would be okay with a car company releasing a car where, like, oh, sorry, once in a while the wheels come off, we forgot to test them. Like, what do you mean you forgot to test them? And so to me, there is like a recklessness in launching product and A-B testing them live on people uh, that I'm, I don't fully understand why we're all very comfortable with that. Like, why are we okay with this extremely wealthy companies to just use us as a guinea pig? And, and, and we almost feel empathy towards them. Like, oh yeah, it's difficult. Like they have so many problems to manage. Just, just do a better job at what you're being paid a lot of money to do. Sorry, I was there. I was trying to be as, as balanced as possible, and then no, I, just... I mean that's super understandable. And that's okay. So my my next question will be: You have two chapter in your book. One is called the uh, culture bubble. So this could be one thing. Like people have just kind of yeah jumped in a bubble. They're outside the world, so that the reason why this is happening. Or and you have another chapter which is a psychopath of the valley. <laughs> so. <laughs> Where does it come from? Is it more the culture bubble that at some point people have just moved uh, in another world? Or is that pretty much intentional? Or, I mean, they don't, they're not afraid of doing that. It's not a problem. They're delinquent. Um, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, the, culture, the culture that exists in Silicon Valley, which by the way, again, to try to be as, as balanced as possible. I, I, the first part of the book is, is really about analyzing how we got where we are today with all the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I really wanted it to be balanced. I didn't want to do what I unfortunately have seen done too many times in the media or in publishing, where like you, you point finger at one or two really bad people and you're like, this is all their fault and there's nothing good coming out of it. And then that's it. So I wanted to, I wanted to explain as much as possible um, the culture and the people who are uh, part of that culture. Uh, and a lot of them are my friends, like, and I don't think they're horrible people. I think they're actually pretty, pretty cool people. It's just there are things in the culture and things in the way the ecosystem works that has generated all of that. So again, let's start with saying that this culture that I'm, I'm now going to talk about negatively has a lot of positive because we would not have all the uh, massively innovative companies that we b all benefit from uh, if it wasn't for that culture. Uh, it's a culture of innovation, of uh, disruption in the sense of like really changing, challenging the status quo. It's a, it's a very hard playing culture. So I, there's a lot of things that I love about it and I'm a product of it too. So maybe I'm biased, but um, I think though there is also um, some negative aspect to it. So I mentioned it before, um, the, the idea that technology is neutral. 
uh, which is starting to be more and more questions, but for a very long time, it was assumed that technology was a, basically a way to replace humans and make things better and that somehow technology was completely neutral. It would give us the truth, that the truth was kind of embedded into the code. It's not, like whatever is embedded into the code is whatever we put in there. So if we believe that the truth is white, the code will reflect white. If we believe that the truth is pink, the truth will be pink. And so there's no such a thing as tech neutrality. Uh, the other big myth is what I call the Steve Jobs syndrome. Uh, and this one I have encountered so many times that it's, it's, uh, it, I, I always, it always makes me smile until it doesn't, but is this, is this deep belief that to be a genius, you have to be a jerk. And so it's not like he was a genius despite being a jerk. It's like, no, no, he was a genius because he was a jerk. And, and that to me is mind blowing. Uh, especially for people who are supposed to be so logical and so analytical. Uh, the problem though, is that it, it makes absolutely normal a certain set of behavior which have, uh, which demonstrates very little empathy. Like it's, it's okay to be rude to people. It's okay to not care about certain people because again, like if you're, if you're truly visionary, if you're really a fantastic genius, um, like, it's okay to be a jerk. Actually, it's, it's required. If you're too nice, you're probably not smart enough, which I have heard many times, like, like almost verbatim, like if you're nice, you're probably not smart enough. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's another big myth. Then there's the, the meritocracy myth. I, I don't, I understand it and I want to believe in it. I like, I wish indeed, like if you work hard enough and you're smart enough, like, of course you're gonna uh, raise to the top. Somehow though, when you look at all these tech companies, it's amazing how much uh, the, the, the people who raised at the top all look the same. So I don't know, maybe it's in the DNA, like maybe, maybe somehow all, the, the best tend to be white or Asian male in their early 30s, uh, late 20s, early 30s, maybe that's that. Or maybe, just maybe, the meritocratic system doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. So that culture largely contributed to a lot of the problem that we that we talked about. And also like this idea that disruption is always good, which goes hand in hand with like technology is always neutral. Um, a lot of the things that are happening come from, from that. It is also true that it comes from a certain type, type of profile um, that thrive in that environment. Uh, and, and you mentioned the chapter uh, called Psycho of the Valley, where as I was thinking about all my friends, um, including some of them which are running some pretty big tech companies that I talk about in the book, I don't know if they're gonna talk to me again after they read the book, but we'll see. Um, I was, I was um, surprised by how many of their behaviors fit the, the, the medical description of what a psychopath is. Uh, and so in the medical world, um, the way you define a psychopath is by going through a list of 20 criteria, uh, things like uh, ability to ban reality, ability to uh, uh, have very so little emotional intelligence, um, a lot of these, these criteria are actually very, very fit uh, to what big tech is actually doing and leadership, not just the CEO, but in general, the companies are doing. Um, and so it is true that that probably contributed to the problem. Um, I would just say that it's not just the CEO, it's the overall culture, it's the culture that I described before, the hyper gross model that is uh, supported by investors in tech, all of that tend to attract probably more uh, this type of personalities, um, more than other industries. By the way, they are psychopaths in a ton of other industries. Um, and it tend to um, amplify these traits. I think a lot of these executives, once they put into that environment, will tend to uh, grow these traits 
even more. I'm going to stop here. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, we have 20 minutes left. We've been talking a lot about the problem, but maybe we should um, talk about hope, how to, how to fix that. And, you know, are there any uh, counter power? Uh, who are the example that we should follow today? And uh, I would like also after that to, to talk more about the um, like company workforce life and how we can, you know, bring empathy directly in the, um, inside the companies to make a change? Sure. Uh, so to, to me, it all starts by putting, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it all comes down to how do we put back human at the center of everything? How do we make sure that technology is built by human for humans uh, and is truly going back to the roots of what we all wanted to do, which is really making the world a better place. I know it makes everybody smile by now because we've used that phrase so many times, but I, I still wake up in the morning and a lot of my peers do because we believe that innovation uh, is actually gonna help humanity um, and, and give better standards of living uh, around the world. So I think it's, it's really about just how do you put back the human at the center of every decision that you make and become basically more empathetic to, to use the, the, the word that I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan of. Empathy should run the world. Um, so it starts with company. Again, I'm a capitalist. I believe that you, companies are the best suited to solve most of the problems. Not all of them, but most of them. Um, private companies, I mean. And so it starts by how can we, um, as tech leaders, um, make our companies more empathetic from the inside? I think it starts with um, the way we recruit, promote more empathetic leaders, the way or key processes, uh, whatever they are. I'm not just talking about people processes. I'm also talking about the way we build our products before we release them. Um, how do we make sure that all these key processes, all the decision making that we do day in, day out, has actually a human component? And, and it seems obvious, but the number of time where I've been in rooms where the only thing that we really discuss is the impact on uh, return rates, is the impact on click rates, is the impact on average order value. And at no point in time, we're like, okay, wait a minute, let, let's just step back for a second. And like, is it good for a user? Like, do we actually want that outside of our door? Um, so really basically embedding em empathy in, in all our key process uh, would, be, would be hugely helpful. And I can tell you, it's not being done. It seems obvious, but it's not being done. Uh, it's about being more transparent. It's about increasing diversity. Diversity is a huge driver of empathy because diversity forces you um, to try to understand people who are not like you. And empathy at its core, it's about figuring out, it's about trying to understand other people and how they react to different things and taking that into account into your decision making. And so because of that, diversity is critically important. Uh, beyond that, so beyond like just internally uh, in the company, there are other things that we as tech leaders should be really focusing on. Uh, we, should be, we should be really having in-depth conversation about the surveillance economy. Uh, and it doesn't concern just social media. Uh, it concerns pretty much any of us because I'm, based on my experience in real estate, in travel and in e-commerce, uh, we all rely very heavily on data again, whether or not we're a social network uh, kind of company. And so we have to ask ourselves, like how do, we, um, how do we allow our users to better manage their data? How do we limit micro-targeting? How do we move to opt-in for data mining and personalization rather than opt-out? How do we give them full transparency? That is hugely important uh, to create companies which are much more respectful of the, the citizen they are interacting with. Uh, we need to become better corporate citizens. And I, again, that's going to be a, a, a likely um, uh, debated topic, but I think that tech companies should have 
big conversation around whether or not they should be using tax havens. Like, how is it okay uh, for companies that make billions of dollars of profit to um, use offshore system and not pay taxes or pay very, very limited taxes? And, and, and in my book, I, I go into fairly in-depth analysis of how little all these companies pay. And it's all legal, by the way. I'm not, I'm not accusing them of doing that illegally. Uh, so there's a huge role that the governments need to play into like changing our tax code. But like if you're a leader and you operate in Europe or you operate in the US, why can't you just pay your taxes rather like the way they're supposed to be paid rather than uh, using the Cayman Island or some, uh, it's less being used now, but some kind of double Dutch tax system to pay almost zero tax. How is that okay? So becoming better corporate citizens to actually be part of the society uh, that, that you are using, uh, you're leveraging to be successful feels to me like a pretty important thing. And uh, in the US, I think having a conversation around gig workers and uh, what kind of base benefits worker, gig workers should have. And I'm saying in the US because in Europe, we usually have uh, healthcare system and social system provided by governance that kind of solve part of these problems. Like same thing, like if you want to be an empathetic company, if you want to take care of the world that nurtures you, why would you, why would you not want all, your, all the people uh, that you benefit from to be properly taken care of, especially because you have the money to do it? Um, we should be having conversation around uh, how as tech company we can preserve civil discourse. We should have conversation as tech companies about how do we interact with all the other stakeholders in society, et cetera, et cetera. So that's on the company side. And then very briefly, um, again, I'm gonna go back to self-regulation doesn't work uh, on its own. I do strongly believe, and maybe I'm, that's because I'm European, uh, but I, I do strongly believe that government have a key role to play. It is not about government telling companies to do, uh, telling them what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's about uh, creating, uh, creating guardrails and creating visions and creating uh, clarity around what you can and cannot do in a democratic society. Uh, and so it needs to start with antitrust. Um, and I, because I don't believe it's possible to regulate a company that is more powerful than a government. I'm not saying that antitrust needs to be used as a blanket tool. Um, not every company needs to be subject to antitrust. Not every problem can be solved by antitrust. It needs to be used very specifically, but it is extremely hard for a company to care about human beings when it's all too powerful. Right? It's just unfortunately almost like what I would call law of nature. And then once you're done with that, or once you are more aggressive around that, uh, then government needs to move into some of the area that I mentioned before, more or less aggressively, depending on how tech companies are actually operating, uh, implementing fair and equitable taxation. Um, money at the end of the day is really at the core of everything. Until, until companies are paying fair and equitable tax, I think we're gonna keep having a lot of these conversations. Uh, the government needs to modernize labor laws. Uh, government needs to continue fighting to protect privacy. GDPR was a good first step. There's so much more to be done. Um, government needs to continue to fight for the preservation of facts and civil discourse. And they need to set standards for the next wave of innovation, which is AI and facial recognition. And again, I'm talking about standards. I'm not talking about running the companies day to day. I'm not advocating for a TikTok tap type of uh, government involvement. I'm, in, I'm, I'm advocating for more of a GDPR type of involvement. You set the standards. You don't tell companies what to do with it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Sure. Thank you so much for, for what you said. That's, that's really, uh, really important. And um, okay, you are European, but you are living in the US. And I think it's a point of view that we need to, to hear. Um, as a female entrepreneur, uh, I would ask some you uh, something because we see that VCs are finally financial, uh, fun, uh, uh, giving money to, to these jacks. Uh, so I think the problem is the structure actually of, uh, of, of the VC firms 
financement. So we are an petit tech and that's too proud to raise money. Um, and, and I believe that the future of tech relies to diversity and, and to be, and that empathy brings, it's a powerful tool for business. So there is no reason why no financing this, this kind of company. But the fact is that they really, really prefer Steve Jobs. I was super angry today with the Nicolas, uh, Nicola uh, case, you know, this, uh, uh, and I say, okay, will we continue to give billions of dollars to this kind of guys just pushing the car <laughs> on the mountain uh, with no innovation? So that, that, uh, I, I don't say that uh, all the tech leaders uh, didn't innovate, that's not the case, and that's not my purpose. But we are giving every day millions and billions of dollars to these guys, the same, the clones, uh, and that's a problem. And, and what can we do? Because uh, money is power, uh, power is money, and, and we have no female inside, no diversity. So what can we do concretely to change that? Because I think it's the center of this problem. Yeah, so... I, I will I will agree with you that it starts with how companies are being uh, funded. And there is clearly a problem because as of today, most uh, VCs are uh, dominated by, again, white and Asian male. Um, and there is an inherent bias in all of us. <laughs> we tend to like more people who look like us and do the same thing as us. So uh, there are a lot of VCs which are fighting really hard um, to, to change that, but there is clearly not enough. So in my view, it, it, look, there is no magic bullet. I'm not gonna tell you like you do this one thing and then that's it, we solve the problem. I think it does really, really start with making sure that VCs are more diverse um, and go beyond just like lip service to, oh yeah, we're gonna invest in a few more black owned companies. It's not gonna change the problem. Um, the way you do that, honestly, super hard. I think you call them on it. Um, I think that whenever, whenever you are, um, you are with your male colleagues or your male peers, you, you, you talk about it. When you find, uh, you find the VCs which are actually uh, more gender neutral or more, um, more supportive of uh, diversity run, female run uh, companies and there are VCs like that. I think that uh, you network a lot to figure out what to do, where to go, who to talk to, uh, you broadcast as much as you can. There's obviously some sometimes li legal limitation and not everybody wants to be public about this, but when you encounter, uh, as an entrepreneur, when you go and fundraise, when you encounter uh, borderline behaviors, uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about sexual harassment as such, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what is clearly um, a, a biased behavior, like, they, they're not that interested in you because you're a woman. And unfortunately, it, it's still in 2020, it still does happen. Um, I think you talk about it you, and, and you see how comfortable, how, yeah, how comfortable you are being public about it. Uh, sometimes it's not comfortable and I totally get it. I don't, I don't think every woman out there, every minority out there uh, can afford very openly to, to talk about it. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be in a situation where you can, uh, you can talk about some of these things uh, and, and be strong enough to support the consequences of being public about it. So I, I would never criticize anyone who decided to keep this, these stories private. Uh, but yeah, just speak about it the, in the best way you can. If you can't talk about it publicly on Twitter, uh, that's okay, talk about it to your friends, talk, talk about it to the next entrepreneur who's gonna go and talk to this VC. So I think there is, there is something that can be done around awareness and around increasing, uh, increasing pressure, but I'm not gonna lie, I think it's a very steep hill. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I, I hate to finish on a negative note, but I am not sure that I will see in my lifetime mm -hmm. uh, a fundamental 
change. So all I'm trying to do is that at my level to be as open and as public as possible uh, to make sure that whenever my friends go and fundraise, I have a lot of female entrepreneurs uh, as friends and I just direct them towards what I believe to be the VCs which are going to help them the most and, and, and support them the most. And I also warn them very clearly about the one that they should avoid like the plague. Um, and yeah. Yeah, and perhaps to finish uh, about something uh, more uh, positive, Jan asked for example of uh, hepatitis uh, check, and uh, uh, do you have any example to give us? Is, uh, this is something it doesn't exist, so please tell us that it exists and that you have example because uh, we have some uh, in yes. Europe uh, uh, a lot. We have a movement for that. So have you contributed info to to give us? Yeah, you no, know, it, it definitely does exist. Um, I think starting from the, the very big one, if you look at what a Mark Benioff or a Satya Nadella have been doing uh, in their companies, talking about empathy, they actually use the word empathy. They actually talk about social responsibility. They actually um, put money behind their words. I think these are a generation of leaders who are truly thinking about how they can impact the world uh, in a positive way. And it, look, it doesn't mean their companies are perfect though, for, for sure, but I don't expect perfection. I expect accountability. I expect, I expect uh, ownership uh, and desire to make things better. So I think that's that. I think when you talk about uh, potential VC, um, I think, VCs like Sequoia. Sequoia has done a fairly good job at promoting um, female-led or minority-led companies. I think, um, I think at Benchmark Capital, they've started doing quite a lot of things too. And so they are definitely, and then you have VCs which are like, like Eileen Lee has, uh, and I'm blanking on the name of her phone, but like the, um, Eileen has actually been promoting a lot of women. And so like you have um, female led VCs, uh, which also have been moving the needle. So I'm, I'm, I told you, I don't think I will see a massive change in my lifetime, but at the same time, I, I believe that change is on the way. I believe there are women and men who, uh, who are fighting really hard to, to give more space uh, to to women and to minorities, and so the world will definitely be better uh, in in a few years. It just I'm 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 demanding it won't be as good as I would like it to be. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, I was otherwise uh, thinking of doing a new bestie day because um, you know we're in France, we know how to make a rev revolution. <laughs> And it's also linked with the way sometimes, uh, yeah, that you described uh, tech about this uh, feudalism. Um, it's pretty difficult to pronounce in French, basically. I don't, I don't believe in revolution. I believe in evolution. I, I don't believe, for example, the movements around like delete Facebook or mm. I, I don't think it works. I think it works from, from increasing pressure, from pushing uh, really hard on some topic, from being public about it, from doing everything you can at your level by electing the right people, by the way. It's also, to me, mind-blowing that a lot of our uh, officials don't understand tech. Like, at some point, we need to put in office people who understand how all of this works and don't discover during a hearing that Facebook makes money by selling ads. Like, that, that should not be a discovery during a hearing process. And so it's just like, there's so many things. And by the way, in the book, I also talk about that. There's a chapter around, around users and what are the things that can be done. And it's like little by little, no magic bullet, but there's a few things that can, that can be done that over time accumulated can change things. That's a positive note, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we have reached uh, one hour. One last question. It will be more about promoting your book. So uh, it will be released officially on the 29th, if I'm right. Uh, yes. We can buy it online. We can buy it also a hard copy. Someone yes. was asking, I think it was Jan, when the French version will be released, if there is one to be released. Uh, so we are currently in talk with a couple of publishers in France, so we haven't yet uh, signed a deal, but yes, it's supposed to be at some point released in France, in, in French. My guess is 
it's probably not going to be before Q1 or Q2 of next year because of translation time. Okay. Uh, so, but it's, it's available in France. It's just available in English. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. And everyone. I think we have like overall answered all the questions. I'm sorry if we haven't, but I'm sure that uh, Mel will be happy to answer more questions or present sure. them over to us. If we missed something, thank you so much for your time. It was super engaging, super interesting, and like so cool uh, talk that we had with us, with you, sorry. And uh, yeah, read the book. I think we have to learn a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.